Uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a little interlude episode. Um, I've completed uh, three games with Shadow Collective, three games with Hitco, uh, one light and one dark, and so I thought I would do a little uh, reflecting, looking back at uh, how things went, what my experience was like playing those decks, uh, uh, mentioning you know something that um, I maybe didn't like about my personal play style, um, some things I enjoyed about the deck, and some things I learned uh, either about the deck specifically um, or uh, about Star Wars play in general. And then uh, looking at what I can, what I think I need to, to work on uh, going forward. So if you hear me making statements that you think are incorrect uh, about these decks, uh, let me know uh, so I can uh, uh, learn. Uh, that way as well, but this is kind of where I see it after a measly three games, granted. So, um, Shadow Collective, first off, I, I just thematically, I enjoy playing aliens in Star Wars. I've always loved the uh, fringe, uh, the bounty hunters, and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, I'm usually drawn to those sort of decks over uh, Imperial uh, focused decks. So it's neat to see uh, uh, another style other than the um, uh, court or the uh, carbon freezing. And this one a little more focused on weapons and fighting, which is always fun too, right? Uh, the most interesting part of Star Wars to me is the interactivity. I did not enjoy playing the game uh, in the older editions where sometimes you just get into these super boring drain races. Um, Although I feel like uh, there are there are times when there there can be still strategic uh, decisions made there as well. Um, I'll start with the one thing that I that stands out as not really to my preference. The one thing I don't like, I don't like one theater decks as a as a yeah. I just I don't like paying to drain. Maybe I'm just cheap. Maybe that's my real life cheapness spilling over into card gaming. <laughs> but uh, generally, when I'm building decks, it's always with some of each. I do understand that you are vulnerable in that theater. Uh, if I mean, sorry, with two theater decks, you become vulnerable if you go up against a deck like this on the ground because they have more card slots to dedicate to ground. So I do see the advantage uh, in that way, and, and theoretically, I guess Shadow Collective should be able to wipe an opposing two-theater deck off the ground uh, so that um, yeah, so that they, they will be paying to drain too. And I guess the, the plus side is that you have these pings built into the deck so that not all of your uh, force losses coming through on uh, drains. So if I was to build my own version of this, and uh, let me be clear, I'm not saying this would be an improvement, uh, since obviously these are some of the uh, best players in the world designing and building these decks, so it would probably be worse, but uh, if I was building it to my personal style, I would probably add some space, uh, maybe with the Gaul system, uh, I know it's pullable uh, with um, uh, one of the effects, uh, so you could have a starting effect that pulls it and then flip into your inconsequential losses, so you're still, your starting effects would be kind of the same, you just also have Gaul on the table, and you lose a couple of card slots for that. Um, does this deck need Gaul? I, I think it's a really cool ability to, to shoot and remove people immediately. Um, I guess the weakness is that you'd have to dedicate enough space to being able to hold it. Um, but there's enough pilots in here that with a few um, with a few ships that have a large capacity, um, you could you could throw some bodies up there to soak attrition and that sort of stuff too. So anyhow, that's that's the one thing that isn't to my preference, but as far as what I enjoyed, I really enjoy the uh, staying power that the weapons provide, um, losing just weapons to attrition and then them having them cycle back into your deck and pulling them back out. Um, this deck is really, uh, as well as shooting uh, opponents and causing attrition loss, it's very well suited to winning that war of attrition on the ground. Um, 
attrition in the literal sense, not the not the Star Wars sense, but uh, yeah. So the 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 weapons uh, that's something that I uh, we'll talk about that later. And you, you need to get good of it. Um, and then I also enjoy the flexibility that it's not necessarily a deck that has to set up on all its own sites. Um, so you have your three battlegrounds if you need it uh, to get your objective ping. Um, but you can also go and evade imposing battlegrounds fairly easily. Uh, and the great part about that is that your first light sites are not really that vulnerable since they all um, have the minus one to drain on the opposing side. Uh, so four strain minus one, uh, four strain minus one, uh, and four strain minus one. Uh, unless they're playing musicians. Um, so that, yeah, that gives you that flexibility. You don't feel like you have to go down to your first light sites uh, if the opponent has some other options. Um, as far as what I learned, I uh, just want to give a quick shout out to um, uh, Challenger uh, on the uh, forums. Uh, provided some really good feedback uh, from the games there in the, in the thread that I have. And so I learned a lot of things, a couple things that I want to talk about uh, just in general uh, is that uh, one of the things he mentioned was not over committing too early. It is still, this deck is still a uh, beat down deck of sorts. So, you know, uh, if you want to go down to the Hoth marker to start some drains, uh, that could be fine. But... Um, make sure that you have a reasonable force there so that you don't get beat down and then you can hold back and kind of see where they deploy and, and kind of counteract their plans. So I guess be flexible in your play style there as well. Um, I guess I already said two things that I enjoy, but I also enjoy the, the starting the gick effect and having the gick. Like you do feel that if you do spread, you're not that uh, vulnerable However, I guess you don't want to lose these early. They're they're more for maybe the late game where you really want to spread out. But uh, and then another thing I learned uh, again, Challenger mentioned this as well as the Masasi Training Temple uh, YouTube channel uh, commented on one of the videos. So uh, it does some good content over there as well with game breakdowns and and, uh, and deck builds and stuff. So be sure to check that out. But uh, they talk about using Force Push, and so obviously uh, this is a card. Um, that I haven't played a lot uh, since it's a virtual uh, card. And so this exchanging two cards from hand with one from the force pile, it can be done in any phase. Um, and so there was uh, a couple times where I was using force before doing this. So uh, they kind of pointed out, if you are going to force push, you should figure that out at the start of the turn and then make sure you're using it uh, before you activate or before you use any of your activated force. That way you have the most, uh, the widest selection um, out of cards possible. So that's a really good thing to keep in mind. And it forces uh, me to plan ahead more, right? What do I want to do this turn? Have that plan in my head before I start uh, doing anything, using any force. Uh, and then one thing that I think I would need to improve on playing the deck. Obviously there are lots to improve, lots of areas to improve, but specifically I think uh, capitalizing on that staying power and um, making sure I can put like multiple weapons down if I need to onto someone so that I can just lose weapons, not lose people when I'm battling and then really make, the, make use out of my uh, people as efficiently as possible. And then also, when is the point in the game to pivot to spreading? Uh, there was a couple times where I had a, a, a Proxima stack um, on the first light for probably longer than I needed. And so I was uh, potentially costing myself uh, force loss there. Or costing myself the opportunity to cause uh, force loss there. So overall uh very fun deck the one thing i still don't know uh that much is when do you want to recirculate and reshuffle when you flip this i was kind of just doing it on hey if i saw high destiny go i would do it uh, i know it is much more useful later game so you can activate all your force flip and then uh, recirculate to keep shooting and keep drawing destiny 
but I wasn't sure outside of that scenario if there are times when you want to be recirculating and reshuffling or not. Um, yeah, overall, enjoy the deck. Lots of fun combat stuff to do, and uh, and would definitely uh, pick it up and play it again. All right, uh, the other deck that I played was uh, this Hitco deck. Um, so this is, and yeah, sorry, I, I think I mentioned this before, but these are from the uh, Outrider Cups. This was Bastion's build, and this is um, uh, Justin Branch's build. Um, again, a deck I had no experience uh, playing going into this, and also I, I haven't ever really played a mains deck. Uh, even when I played back in the day, my collection wasn't, um, extensive enough that I could build this style of deck. Um, so yeah, this was this was definitely a new experience to me. Uh, the one thing that I didn't really like is it it looks like the deck is built to win off of these blowouts with uh, the destiny adding and the Jedi presences to double. Um, and and to me it felt like a lot of times. Well, I could do that, but they've got a gick, or I could do that, but and maybe it's because a couple of the games I actually played against Shadow Collective, so they had this um, this effect in play to start, so they had that extra protection. Maybe it was just bad matchups in that way. Um, but I, yeah, I felt like, well, if I don't get that blowout, can I win the game? Um, and, and maybe that's not accurate. You obviously, if you've got more experience with Hitco, let me know. Uh, different different paths to victory there. Um, now, kind of the counterpoint to that is that I did enjoy that there are multiple damage sources, so you can get your drains, but you can start stacking cards by winning battles, so um, you can start uh, uh, getting battles, or lose, causing them loss by initiating withdraw their fire. So maybe, maybe it doesn't need to blow up, maybe it can just grind out with those two effects in play. Um, and then stacking a, a big drain at uh, Ewok Village with the uh, proficiency and with the um, prophecy. Um, so yeah, I did I did enjoy that it at least has that option. Um, the other thing I really enjoyed is the low card slots dedicated to activation. So one, two, three. That is it. That is all the locations in that in this deck, which is crazy. Like even. You look at Shadow Collective Five. That's that's pretty low too. But there's there's decks that I've seen that you know you might have six or seven locations in them, and so that frees up a lot of space um, for your uh, for the rest of the deck, which is great. Um, again, not a huge fan of single theater. I don't know that there's a. I don't think you would have a way really to put much space in here um, so I, I understand it for sure um, a couple things that I learned when playing the games uh, with this deck even more so than Shadow Collective I think you really don't want to be first on the board um, you really do respond you really are responding to what they're doing and coming for a beatdown so um, Make sure that you're going slow, building your hand, waiting for your opportunity, uh, and that seems to be the the best route to take. Um, and then the other thing I learned in general was that you really need to be aware of the game state, and and it, people were nice enough on GIMP to to give reverts in a few cases, but there were a few cases where. I would try to play a card because it was lit up and it uh, wasn't my action I was actually supposed to be losing a card from uh, maybe it was a ping from uh, the, the counterpart of draw their fire I can't remember what it's called uh, before the battle starts or maybe it's uh, some other force loss that's been caused off a character um, and so I thought, oh, here, I'm, I'm going to play this card. And I clicked on it, and then it went to the lost pile. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just making sure that I'm always uh, being aware of exactly uh, what's happening in the game. 
Although I found that most people are fairly friendly uh, with with giving uh, take backs over stuff like that. Uh, perhaps in a more high stakes spot that wouldn't be the case. But uh, and then the one thing I need to get better at with this deck, I think, is I don't think in any games I I really lock down this drain here at the Ewok Village with the Prophecy of Force not being able to move. So I, I do want to play at least one more game where I really try to focus on getting Daughter down uh, or Luke to the village, getting this over there, and then keeping it there, causing some drain. Although I guess if you're wanting to Navrin Luke off to go fight somewhere else, it's probably Daughter that needs to stay here. So maybe you're looking at like Daughter, Chewy, um, uh, holding this site. Yeah, so that's that's one thing I think I definitely uh, definitely need to get better at, and then also you know keeping keeping work of my objective. Um, I think there was a few times where I wasn't uh, uh, wasn't making them stack a card uh, here. So anyhow, those are my reflections for these two decks. Uh, we are uh, moving on to um, uh, the. Uh, next decks here are going to be communing, uh, Qui-Gon communing, and uh, TTO. Uh, so we will see uh, how those uh, go. And again, I think I think this is going to be another mains deck, so I'll get another chance to um, uh, redeem myself with my poor uh, hit co play. Uh, and TTO, I believe, is a space deck, so that'll be nice too, since we've had three ground decks here. Um, It'd be nice to get into space. So thank you very much for watching, and uh, until next time, may uh, we have a wonderful afternoon, day, whenever you're watching.